Hello everyone and welcome back to Microbiology. Um, in today's session we are going to go over some a few selected diseases of the cardiovascular and the lymphatic system. So a little bit of an overview of the cardiovascular system, and, and keep in mind, I, I recognize that many of you have already taken a &T, so a lot of this is very familiar to you, so I won't go over it at great detail, but I will kind of discuss it a little bit. So um, your cardiovascular system and your lymphatic systems are kind of intertwined with one another, meaning that your cardiovascular system consists of your heart and the blood vessels, veins, and arteries, and then you have the lymphatic system that consists of your lymphatic vessels, which are kind of analogous to veins and arteries, um, but they carry lymph instead of carrying blood, like the veins and arteries carry blood. Um, and then you also have lymph nodes. Um, so they are kind of, where lymphatic vessels, they kind of run and enter out of the venule in on the venous and the cardiovascular system. So blood is carried by the veins and arteries, um, and lymph is carried by um, the lymphatic system and it transports interstitial fluid to the blood and it helps to maintain that blood volume ratio of plasma. In the lymph nodes, you'll find different types of immune cells, specifically so like macrophages, B cells, and T cells. And all of these immune cells that you, we have listed here, you should be familiar with from um, our previous chapters in innate and adaptive immunity. So a little bit of uh, terminology to go over before we actually get into any of these diseases. Septemia is the persistent pathogen or their toxins in the blood, and we've looked at how we can see where it's, sometimes it's not necessarily the bacteria that's causing all the problem. When we looked at clostridium um, botulism, it's the toxin that is really an issue. So whether we find the toxin or the bacteria in the blood that's considered septemia, if it's an ongoing persistent thing. Sepsis is a systematic inflammatory response, which means it will happen all throughout the body. Severe sepsis differs from sepsis in that this is where we're going to have a drop in blood pressure. And that drop in blood pressure can cause organ failure to take place um, because of that decrease in blood pressure. And if the drop is so drastic, then we would consider that septic shock. If the drop in blood pressure is as a result of the sepsemia, then we call it septic shock. Um, and if we can't bring that blood pressure up with either plasma expander, expanders or by increasing the volume of the blood, then it can lead to organ failure, as I said before. Lymphonitis is an inflamed lymphatic vessel, which usually accompanies epsemia and septic shock. So let's go on to um, talk about uh, two different classes of sepsis here. We have gram-negative sepsis and gram-positive. Um, for gram-negative sepsis, it's typically the endotoxin, or we can call it endotoxin shock, because it's the endotoxin that causes the blood pressure to decrease. Um, and that endotoxin, what happens is that once the bacteria is phagocytized by any of your phagocytotic cells, um, remember that the outside of a gram-negative organism has this um, endotoxin um, it may have this endotoxin associated with the LPS layer, that outer, outer shell membrane. So when that cell, the gram-negative cell is phagocytized, then it releases this toxin and it makes the cell sick. So if you take antibiotics, then you're causing more of these toxins to be released by killing more of these gram-negative cells. So sometimes the antibiotics can actually worsen the condition. Um, treatments that we have for this, and it's activated protein C, which acts as an anticoagulant um, to prevent the blood pressure for, or the blood, red blood cells from coagulating together and then that subsequent drop in pressure. Gram positive sepsis are usually caused by um, group B streptococcus and enterococcus organisms, and they're typically considered. To be, um, we find them mostly as part of noxicomal infections or infections that you would acquire during your hospital stay. For perosepsis or childbirth heat fever, it's caused by Streptococcus pyrogens. Start sending these things here. Um, it's also called for pearl fever. We don't see this as routinely as we did, oh, say, 100 years ago or so, and that's as a result of more hygienic. Um, things happening in a hospital setting. But what happens is that the disease of the coccus pyrogens, which um, can be carried by healthy people, you might have some on you, 
um, uh, the bacterium is transmitted to the mother during childbirth by the attending physicians or the midwives. And we saw this a lot before Similwise really introduced and advocated that hand washing. And it causes an inflammation of the uterus, um, and then it makes its way into the bloodstream, really high fever, and then the patient um, may die without intervention or antibiotic treatment. Bacterial infections of the heart, a little bit more terminology. Endocarditis is an inflammation of the endocardium of the heart itself. Some acute bacterial endocarditis is caused by, and, and for, for these endocarditis and these inflammations of the heart, they're primarily caused by bacteria that are just normally found in the mouth or in the oral mucosa of the mouth area. And then they make their way either through um, an infection, so a tooth, uh, an abscess tooth, or through an unclean piercing, like a tongue piercing or a lip piercing. And they make their way from the mouth, the oral cavity, into the bloodstream. So some acute bacterial endocarditis is caused by um, alpha hemolytic streptococci from the mouth. And when we say alpha hemolytic, I want you to go back to your blood auger plates and remember those three different types of hemolysis we had. Alpha, beta, and gamma. Gamma, no hemolysis. Beta, um, we had a complete hemolysis of the red blood cell. And then alpha, we had incomplete hemolysis. Acute bacterial endocarditis can be caused um, from staph aureus in the mouth. And between the two of these, the acute bacterial endocarditis is the more severe. And then pericarditis, which is the inflammation of the pericardial sac that holds the heart, is caused by streptococci. So rheumatic fever is an inflammation of the heart valve itself. Um, it's an autoimmune complication of streptococcus pyrogens infections um, that your body hasn't been able to fight off. It will cause nodules to form at the joints. Um, definitely, there's going to be a lot of pain associated with this. It's definitely a fever that's associated with it. There's limited mo mobility at the joint itself as a result of the infection. Infection, it can be um, treated with antibiotics. Anthrax, Bacillus anthrax, is a gram-positive endosporum aerobic rod. Now, anthrax itself, if you see it, and we automatically say, ooh, anthrax, very scary, it's going to kill me. But it depends on what type that you have contracted. We, um, anthrax is always in the soil. So we routinely find it in the soil, but um, it doesn't always lead, it doesn't always lead in the fatality. Um, because it's routinely found in the soil. Um, cattle and sheep grazing animals are routinely vaccinated for it because they come into contact with it quite a bit. There are three different forms of anthrax. You can have inhalational, or what we call pulmonary anthrax, which is the most fatal. You can have in, um, ingestional. When you ingest the anthrax spores from uh, undercooked meat, um, or you can have cutaneous anthrax, which is just a, a nice little icky-looking black scab or scar. Um, and that's usually for people that are working a lot in the soil. We can treat it, um, all forms of this. The pulmonary or inhalational anthrax is obviously the most difficult to treat and require treatment almost immediately um, in order to be effective. But cisplofloraxin and doxycycline are the routine medication for treatment. So cutaneous anthrax, that's the one that you just kind of get from the soil. You kind of leave a, a mark on your the area where it, it gets into the body. Um, mortality rate is fairly low on that. It's, I think it's probably less than 20%, especially if you seek medical attention and it didn't go to um, Gastrointestinal is from the ingestion of undercooked contaminated food. A little bit higher mortality rate, but because you have um, uh, lots of immune cells in your digestive system that sometimes it can it can keep that from going systemic and that in combination with antibiotics would help to prevent um, fatal mortality from happening there. Um, and then we have inhalational or pulmonary anthrax where you inhale the spores. This is the one that we're afraid of when we had our politicians or we had our postal workers were working and handling the smell and have this um, dried powdery substance in there and it was believed to be anthrax and we've had some people actually 
um, die or get very sick as a result of the disease type that we're talking about. So when you inhale the endospores, they then will go through their uh, germinated process in your lungs, and it's fatal within 24 hours, 24 to 48 hours, I believe, especially if you don't get treatment right away. Gain green. Um, gas gangrene is caused by colostridium perfigens, which is a gram positive endospore um, forming anaerobic rod. A um, couple of things that we have to kind of look at the, the lineage of how things go here. First, gas gangrene um, develops as a result of ischemia, which is a loss of blood supply to the tissue. Um, that can happen for a variety of reasons. There can be an injury to the area where it loses blood supply um, any time, or it could be that the tissue was cut off from the circulation. So when you think about cutting the tissue off from circulation, think about wrapping a rubber band around your finger several times until your finger turns, like, really white or really blue. And that's cutting off that circulation. Now keep in mind, this has to be for, for a long period of time and you really truly cut off all circulation. So anything that leads to a loss of blood supply is going to lead to necrosis, which is the death of the tissue. That makes sense for us because we know oxygen and nutrients are carried by your cardiovascular system, your veins, your arteries specifically, and your veins carry away the, the, the other stuff, the carbon dioxide and the waste products. But if we can't get a good blood supply to get those nutrients and that oxygen there, then that's going to cause the tissue to die. So gangrene is the death of that soft tissue. Now, gas gangrene, so if you come into contact with this gram-positive endospore forming anaerobic rod, because there's not a good oxygen supply there, there isn't any oxygen supply because it's been cut off. And this gangrene, like, or this clostridium, likes to grow in places where there's no oxygen and there's necrotic tissue. So now you've set up a perfect storm for gas gangrene. Um, the treatment for this includes surgical removal of that tissue, and also we can use a hyperbaric chamber to treat gas gangrene. Hyperbaric chambers work because they inundate the area with oxygen. And remember, this is an obligate anaerobe, so it has to have um, be in an oxygen-free environment, so oxygen is actually toxic to it. All right, so a little disease in focus here. 55-year-old man with poor circulation in his legs spells an infection following injury to a toe. Dead tissue further reduces circulation, requiring the amputation of the toes. What infection could cause these symptoms? Well, it could be the anthrax that we talked about, or it could be the gas gangrene. So we look at this gram stain we have here. So those are our two options. We have a rod. So we know that we have rod-shaped cells here. And uh, they're purple, so they're gram-positive. So that would mean that our culprit would have to be colostridium perfigens. All right, so on to another bacteria. Um, now we are in the plague gland caused by Yersinia pestis, which is a gram-negative rod. The reservoir of the, the plague, and the most famous you're probably familiar with is the bubonic plague, are rats and ground squirrels and prairie dogs. Um, the vector, which is going to transmit the bacteria from one reservoir to another. Humans can also be reservoirs for the plague, but um, we're not routinely reservoirs for it. The plague has not been completely eradicated. In fact, we still have um, cases of it, and we see it quite frequently in the southwest. So in the western United States, and more concentrated in the southwest, we do see um, uh, the plague still happening. It is treatable with antibiotics. The bubonic plague is um, one that you're probably most familiar with, where it killed Mm, good swath of Europe. I want to say two thirds of the continent died as a result of that black plague, and that just directly relates to a there's no antibiotics, and b we lived in very close proximity with rats, with the reservoir for it. So the fleas bit the rats. The rats, you know, either they bit the people or just even um, you could have pneumonic plague, where you inhale the bacteria into the lungs from the rat dropping. So we lived in very close proximity to rats, and we also lived in very close proximity with one another, so we were able to spread it very quickly. 
with the bubonic plague, the bacteria grows in the blood and in the lymph. Um, and if you continue a plague, a septic shock, you get a and drop in blood pressure. One of the hallmarks of the plague are you have those buboes, which is what they call bubonic plague, which are these blackened, swollen areas of the body. Lyme disease, our next one, also um, has a vector that is an insect. The vector that is the insect, and remember for all of these here, you should know everything on the slide. Um, so the vector for the plague was the flea, the vector for Lyme disease are ticks. So if we go back to our visual map or in your mind of the United States, plague, because we still have it present, it's in the southwestern United States. And when we think of Lyme disease, we see our most um, frequent outbreaks happening in early spring um, and late summer, and those are happening in kind of the middle uh, of the United States, so Midwest, northern Midwest, thinking places like Wisconsin and Michigan, and we also have it in the northeast, so Maine, New York, we kind of see it in those places. Um, the the causative agent or the bacteria for this is Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, the reservoir, unlike the plague reservoir with rats and ground squirrels and prairie dogs. The reservoir are deer, and then the vector, unlike for the plague, which would flee, is a pick. Um, the first symptom that we have is usually that characteristic bullseye rash that we'd see. Um, the second phase of it would consist of an irregular heartbeat and sometimes may progress to encephalitis. And then the third phase of it is chronic arthritis. Um, I know most of you are very, very young, but if you ever watch the um, very first set of reality TV or the birth of reality TV with MTV, the real world, there was a character there that had um, a line to be, I think it was a real world San Francisco, maybe like the second or third season of it, so this is like way back in the 90s, some of you guys weren't even born yet, um, but she definitely had developed Lyme disease and she had the um, arthritis aspect of it um, quite profoundly. So here is the life cycle of Lyme disease, which are, you'll need to know. Um, it's a great question for a short answer question. So first what we have here is that um, we have the uninfected six-leg larva hatches and it develops, and then it feeds on an animal, which is the reservoir for it that is infected with the bacteria. That larva is going to stay dormant. So at this point here, so this is its first summer. This uh, larva is born in the spring, and then here's its first summer, it becomes infected, and then by fall and winter, winter the larva becomes um, dormant, so it's in its dormant stage. Now when the next spring comes around, the larva develops into um, an eight-leg nymph, and then it's that eight-leg nymph that will feed on the um, human, or um, it can feed on the, the a pet, um, human or an animal, and transmit the plague that way. Um, not the plague, here's not the plague, we're talking about Lyme disease, transmit Lyme disease that way. Then the lymph develops into an adult, the adult feeds on a deer, and um, we start the cycle all over again. Aerolocious and anaplasmosis um, are the next disease that we'll talk about. Um, reservoir is a white-tailed deer, so in Illinois we see this quite frequently um, because we have lots of white in Missouri. We have lots of white-tailed deer here. Um, human monocytotrophic aerolysis, cognitive agent, is aerolysis chaperineus. In the gram-negative obligate intracellular um, organism, which means that it cannot reproduce and cannot have life outside of the body. It has to be outside of the cell, so it does so inside white blood cells. And the vector for this is a lone star tick. HGA um, also has a reservoir of ticks, a uh, reservoir of deer, and the vector of ticks. So, so far, there are three different um, diseases, bacterial diseases that we talked about, where the vector are ticks, Lyme disease, HME, HGA, um, oh, sorry, so Lyme disease, HME, and HGA. Moving on to the next class, typhus, um, is caused by Rickettsia species. They are also obligate intracellular parasites, as we saw for HME. 
um, they will reproduce or they may find their life cycle taking place in the endothelial cells of your vascular system. So those are the cells of your, your blood vessels. And the factors for this are anthropods, specifically the anthropod that is uh, known as body life. So typhus can be transmitted as a result of infections with body life. So it's the one type of life that can transmit a disease that is left untreated. It can be very problematic and possibly fatal. Epidemic typhus is caused by a uh, Rixedia species, reservoir or rodent. And remember the vector is body life or ridiculous humanist corpus. Um, it's transmitted when the louse or the lice feeds on um, feces are rubbed into the bite wound of the lice. So the, the lice bites you, you scratch it, the lice defecates on your skin. Not, keep in mind it's microscopic defecation, but it's enough that when you scratch that area and you break the skin, it allows it to get into the bloodstream. Spotted fevers caused by a different type of rickettsia, rickettsia, rickettsia. Um, Rocky Mountain spotted fever is also a, what we call tick-borne typhus as opposed to lice-borne typhus. So the typhus that we just talked about was transmitted by body lice. This particular typhus is transmitted by via ticks. Um, the characteristics of it, needle-like rash, um, and the, the rash, it's a little, um, it's going to appear everywhere. Um, and it's different than measles because usually measles doesn't happen on the palms of your hand and the soles of your feet. But we find that with the Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever that it does happen on the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet. Life cycle for this, make sure you know this, the infected adult tick um, lays eggs, the late eggs is hatched. Um, they take their um, blood mail from a small animal and they've infected it and they develop into a nymph, very, very small, and then the nymph takes the blood milk from a human infecting her, and then develops into an adult tick. Infectious mononucleosis, or mono, this is our first um, virus one that we've talked about here, uh, caused by HV4, or the epstein barr virus. Um, childhood infections are usually asymptomatic, where they just may present themselves as like a cold sort of thing. Um, it's transmitted via saliva, so a lot of times, I know when I was in high school, the entire volleyball team contracted models. They would just share some water bottles um, at practices and at games. Um, a lot of people have probably contracted model and developed model um, at some point. Um, while they were even in high school or college or as a child, um, you get really, 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 really sick. And um, it's very lethargic and malaise and just feel just generally icky. Um, and one of the characteristics of it, how we're able to identify it, is that when we do a blood draw, we see a huge proliferation of your monocytes. Birkitt's lymphosa, um, also caused by the Epstein Barr virus, HHV4. Um, this is a nasal pharyngeal carcinoma, and it can cause cancer. So it's basically mono that causes cancer in people who have a suppressed immune system, specifically people that are um, that have malaria and also have or have AIDS or even severe combined immunodeficiency syndrome. It develops into Birkitt's lymphoma, which is really cancer. Um, because your body's not able to fight off the virus in the same way that you could um, if you did not have these other um, comorbid diseases of malaria or AIDS. Cytomegalovirus infections caused by human herpes virus 4. Um, the infected cells will swell up. That's why it's called um, mega and cyto for cells. Kind of leaves dormant in your white blood cells. And sometimes, depending on who it is, um, it can be asymptomatic or it can be very mild. It can be transmitted um, across the placenta. It can cause mental retardation or some developmental delays in the child. Um, it can be transmitted sexually by blood or by transmitted tissue. On to more, um, now these are all viruses, but these are now the viral fevers. Um, 
star that's the image now the charts that we talk about. Um, yellow fever is caused, and actually the pathogens are all of these, are kind of all like a viral virus. Um, the portal of entry for the most part are the skin. You get bitten by a mosquito. Um, the method of transmission is being bitten by a mosquito, but the reservoirs will sometimes change. So we have yellow fever, and we have um, donkey fever. Donkey fever is also known as bone break fever. All of these fevers that we're going to talk about have really high fevers that are associated with them. Um, and they can also have um, vomiting or nausea, where there's essentially some sort of um, lysis of the red blood cells. There may be some hemorrhaging that's associated with it. Um, and they're going to, uh, and then they may have some stumble differences with them. So for donkey fever, um, big thing that we find there, donkey fever is found that it's indigenous in the Caribbean area. So the places like Puerto Rico, um, Jamaica, yeah, any of the Caribbean place would find that. Um, called bone break fever because it will allow for inflammation of the joints and you really, it's quite painful. Um, yellow fever has some historical significance in that yellow fever was one of the um, huge obstacles in building the Panama Canal. So if you're a history buff, you probably remember that. Um, other viral fevers, hemorrhagic um, fevers, uh, mostly like uh, the Ebola virus, probably in fruit bats and other mammals, um, the Hansa virus, um, in field mice. This is the one that the mode of transmission does not require um, a port of entry through the skin. It, you, you can actually inhale it. Um, what's not on this list is a very new fever um, that is caused by the Zika virus. So you see um, that would kind of fit into this category, but it's not uh, in these books, these textbooks now. Chagas disease caused uh, trypanosomiasis, causative agent trypanosoma cruzii, reservoir rodents, possums, and armadillo, and the vector is called the root of it bug or the kissing bug. It's called the kissing bug because it kind of hangs out on the outside of your mouth, and once it bites you, um, um, then you will become infected with the disease. And here is trypanosoma cruzii, um, American trypanosoma. So my teeth, um, looking at it in a blood smear. Toxal plasmosis, so now we've looked at the viruses, and now we're going to talk about the parasites and the proteins. So trypanosoma, um, cruciate was the first one. The next one that we're going to talk about here is toxoplasma um, gondii. Um, you can get this from undercooked meat because we do see it in, in um, the soil and we do find it that um, sheep and cow, they will routinely have this. And then it's also, we find it in cat species. So this is why that um, for most people, if they develop this, it's just kind of has, it's mild and self-limiting. But for pregnant women, it can lead to a stillborn child. So that's why it's advised that pregnant women can either get rid of their cats or find someone else who can um, take care of their cat for them and change their litter box because this could be problematic for a pregnant woman. Um, and it can cause, even if it doesn't cause stillborn, a stillborn child, um, it can cause neurological damage in the, in the unborn child. And here is the life cycle of this. So the oocyst is shed in the cat species. Um, it goes through what's called sporogony. That sporogony will become a, a mature cyst. And then that mature cyst develops these little, let me pull out my finger pointer. These little guys here are what we call sporozytes. So this is very similar to kind of what the malaria life cycle looks like. So that's where we're going to take time to go over it. So we have these sporozytes. The mature oocytes develop in sporogony. I can say two sporozytes. And they each have um, sporozoites themselves. And that's when we can have it. Um, the sporozoites will either be found in the field mouse or in the um, cattle. Or we can have the infected oocyst that's just in the, um, the cat feces. Um, and when the pregnant woman is changing the litter box, and then she may become infected, and her fetus may um, die as a result of that. Um, the sporozoites from the ingested oocyst can be the animal tissue, and then they can kind of cause this cycle to start over. 
All right, on to malaria. Um, the two most common forms of malaria are caused by Plasmonium malariae and Plasmonium um, falciparum. Uh, the vector of this is the Anopheles mosquito, and they're the definitive host, like the end all be all host, is the Anopheles mosquito as well. So the, not only are they able to carry and transmit it, but they also can carry it indefinitely. Um, best treatment for malaria, we do have prophylactic treatment of vaccination for it, but it's very painful. Um, they usually don't give it to you unless you're going to definitely be in a place that's indigenous for malaria and there's a high likelihood of catching it. Um, the treatments, you also have treatments for malaria, but they're very expensive. So uh, people that usually contract malaria from the United States, they come home and get the treatments because we have the drugs readily available. Whether if you're doing work in a developing nation, they may not have the treatments readily available for you. So we see the red blood cells are being attacked here. One of the best ways to diagnose malaria is that we'll look at a blood smear and we look for these ring forms on the inside, which lets us know that these are merozoites. Um, merozoites with these rings shouldn't be inside your red blood cells. And that's the quickest, most effective way that we can have a diagnosis for malaria, especially if we're in the field or in places where there um, is uh, not ready access to um, different types of biochemical tests to test for the presence of this um, protozoan. So I'm going to start this. I can get my star out. So this is something that's worth memorize, remembering. All right, stamp it. So the life cycle of malaria. So we have the infected mosquito. It bites the human. Sporozoites are going to migrate through the bloodstream to the liver. These sporozoites are then are going to undergo what they call schistogony in the liver, and you have the merozoites that are produced. The merozoites are then going to be, so this is all happening in the liver. The merozoites then are going to be released into the bloodstream from the liver, and then that's where they get their opportunity to come into contact with red blood cells. The merozoites are going to develop that ring that we looked at, that O ring that we said we use for diagnosis. Um, it grows and divides, producing more merozoites until it actually lyses the red blood cell. When that red blood cell ruptures and lyses, those merozoites go on and they um, can affect new red blood cells, and then some of them will be male and some of them will be female. So the male and the female gametes um, are then going to mate. Um, and when those male and female gametes mate, um, then you have, so they have this kind of an asexual stage, and then they have a sexual stage. The orange side of this is the sexual stage, where the merozoites, some became male, some became female, then they finally mate with one another. Um, and you have this zygote that's produced, and then the zygotes, um, and, and then we have it kind of, this part happens kind of in the mosquito. But then those zygotes can then um, become sporozoites that will be released from the saliva of the mosquito into the human. So at this point here, if a person which were to bite this intermediate host, but to bite this human, these merozoites can become male and female. This happens in the mosquito where they have the sexual reproduction portion of it. And in the mosquito's digestive tract, they unite to form a zygote. And then you have the sporozoites in the salivary gland. So when the mosquito goes and bites somebody else, then you have the sporozoites that go to the liver. And after they go to the liver, um, then they divide and become merozoites that go through the bloodstream. Those merozoites then affect those red blood cells and cause the red blood cells to burst. And then you have these merozoites that are in the bloodstream. Um, and that some of those are going to be picked up by the mosquitoes. They turn the male and the female gametes. They mate. And then you have this whole cycle start all over again. So as I said before, we do have probiotic treatment for it. Um, Chloroquinone, um, meloforin, all of those are kind of vaccines that we have for it. Um, we do have medical treatment for it, medications for malaria, but the best way to control malaria is bed nets and also to try to control the mosquito population. However, trying to control the mosquito's population has proven to be quite difficult um, for a variety of different reasons. And then the last one that we're going to talk about is schistom schistomyces, which um, 
can be caused just schistosomyces in the urethra or schistosomyces in um, um, other parts of the body, um, and that's just from swimming in infected water. So here we have a life cycle of it. Um, it's called a, a schisto because um, the male and the female permanently live together. The female lives on the inside of the male, and they constantly are mating and they're producing eggs. Um, we have our intermediate host here, and it produces um, the carne, and then the carne can penetrate the human skin. They can also go through the urethra and make their way into the lymphatic system and the blood vessels as they become adults. All right, so that is the end of that, and we finished up this session. All right, have a great day.